Uh, usually, when I speak about the Lord's Prayer, I focus on Luke chapter 11, but I feel kind of led to the Matthew chapter 6 version of this this morning. And it's very possible that we may not get through the whole thing, or we may have to just skim the surface on parts of it, but, but we are going to take some time this morning and kind of use this as our uh, points and our guideline, and we're going to start in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. And then we're going to read down at least through verse 15 by the grace of God. So let's go ahead and read that together. Then we'll come back and, and uh, speak about it. Uh, Matthew 6, 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. Wow. That's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? Well, let's start in verse 1. It might be more of a teaching format this morning, but Jesus uh, uh, is giving us this great example of how to pray. And we know that it's not just a formula or a, a necklace full of rosary beads, you know, that through vain repetition is going to get results. But it's a relationship. And that's exactly how he starts out. He says, Therefore, in this manner, pray, Our Father in heaven... So let's just stop right there and start with that. Our Father in Heaven. Right at the very beginning, we have to make an acknowledgement here. God is everyone's Creator, but He's not everybody's Father. That's why it doesn't. things don't always work the same in other people's lives the way they work in our lives. Because God is our Father. Through faith in Jesus, He's become our Father. He's taken on uh, the responsibility to raise us uh, and to care for us and to supply every need as long as we'll trust in Him and, and listen to Him. And the, We could spend a long time talking about what a father does. But I want to talk from this aspect uh, this morning and I want you to realize that we have to take ownership in God's fatherhood. We have to take ownership in the fact that God is our Father. He's not just a Father. He's our Father. He's my daddy. <laughs> He's my heavenly daddy. My heavenly father. And we really need to, to uh, sink our faith into that. Realizing that God is our father. <laughs> that He chose me to be His son. And you to be His son. Men and women alike. And that He took on the responsibility of being our father. That simple truth is pretty powerful if you think about it. Now, I don't know very many people that would disown their natural father, even if he was a scoundrel and a hoodlum. There are a few, but there are not very many people that would cut off all ties with their natural father, even if he was a rascal. Some, some have, I know. But our father is so much more than that. He's a heavenly father. Our father in heaven. He is the exemplification of all perfection in every way. He's the perfect dad, the perfect father. And he chose to be our father. By choice, he didn't have to take us. Sometimes we think that God had to take us. Well, you know, God don't really like me very much. He had to take me because I prayed a prayer of repentance and now you're stuck with me, God. But that's not the way God thinks because the way God thinks, he says that I chose you first. He says that while you were still in your mother's womb being knit together, I knew you. He says that before you even had any concern or interest in me at all, I predestined you to do great things. He says that I, I know the plans that I have for you and my plans are to prosper you and to give you a future and to give you a hope. Not to harm you. See, that's the kind of heavenly Father that we have. That's our dad. That's our Father. Not everybody gets that privilege of calling Him Father like we do. He's our Heavenly Father. Jesus is showing us that this is the way to pray. 
And this is the way to get results. Now, in Luke chapter 11, the disciples ask Jesus, could you teach us how to pray? Here Jesus is teaching uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, and He volunteers the information. But eyes were fixed on Him. Ears were listening attentively. Everyone wanted to know what He had to say. Well, why do you think that is? Do you think it's because God had a prayer list, so, or Jesus rather, had a prayer list so long that when He pulled it out of His pocket, it rolled down and hit the ground? Do you think it's because Jesus spent long hours in trembling and fear and blood, sweat and tears, never getting results, but He was faithful to it? Why do you think that people really wanted to know how Jesus prayed? Do you think it could be that when Jesus prayed, He got results? That when Jesus spoke, He spoke as a man that had authority. And they said that's what sets you aside from all the other teachers of the law and the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus, when you teach, you have authority. Lord, when you command the demons, the demons come out. When you curse the sickness and speak health, health flows. Life comes. When you pray for a person, they get the answer. They get the result. And Jesus has a perfect track record. And because people noticed that and they saw that, they wanted to know how to pray like Jesus prayed. Well, here Jesus volunteers the information. And He says, if you want to pray like I pray, the first place we've got to start is understanding that you have a heavenly Father. Everybody's got a heavenly Creator. But you and I, we got a heavenly Father. We got a perfect heavenly Father who loves us in every way that was even willing to give up His monogenius, His only begotten Son, Jesus, for us so that we could come into fellowship with Him. Next of all, we got a faithful Father. A realization of God of our Father leads us to realize His faithfulness. Now I want to read a, one of my kind of key scriptures in my life. In John chapter 14, verse number 18. John 14, 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Over and over again, when you read the red letters that Jesus spoke, He speaks of God being His Father and God being our Father. That He's taken from His relationship in the Father and that He's literally imparted that into us. The Bible calls Jesus the firstborn of many brethren. We're the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Actually, we're the brothers because uh, in, in the uh, Hebrew concept, the uh, women were a second-class citizen. But in the New Testament context, the way that Jesus taught it and the apostles taught, taught it and revealed the Word of God, we're all sons. Uh, so, praise God. So, Jesus says that I won't leave you as orphans. See, sometimes we just think that God saved us because He had to, but that's all He's going to do for us. You know, I already, I already shed my blood to save you. I ain't going to do no more for you. That's how we sometimes view God. But it's nothing like that at all. God is completely invested in us by choice. He said, I won't leave you as an orphan. You see, that means that He went out and He adopted us. He sought us out. He looked for us. He looked throughout all the earth and all creation and He found you. And He loved you before you even loved Him. And He said, if you'll just believe in Me through faith in Jesus, then I will not leave you as an orphan. I will adopt you as My own child. I'll adopt you. I'll take you in. I'll be a faithful father. There have been many times in my life that I've needed Jesus to come to me, and He always has. Uh, some of those times, it's not visibly apparent. There are many times when I look like things are just going fine, but I'm all broken up on the inside, and I'm not going to uh, burden too many people with that. My family sees it a little more probably, but, but I'm not going to burden people with that because people can't help me anyway. But I'll come and I'll get on this altar, or I'll go get in a secret place with God, and I'll remind God of His promise. And I'll say, Jesus, You promised me that You weren't going to leave me as an orphan. You promised me that You were going to come to me. You promised me that You were going to send me a helper. And as I, uh, as I lay myself uh, humbly before uh, God's presence, Jesus comes to me. And there's a shift in the atmosphere. And there's a shift in my attitude. And there's a shift in the way I look at things. And there's a shift in the way I get things done. Because I've gotten out of myself now and I've gotten into the provision of my Heavenly Father. 
He's a faithful Father. He will come to you. Uh, I've had several people talk to me in their lives about coming back to God. I had just a, a small encounter a couple weeks ago. We went down to the, just to check it out, the outlet mall north of Cincinnati. I can't remember which one it was. Do you remember, Delaney? I think Preston's right. Premium outlet. Well, we were there, and, and Silas was playing on the big playground. Delaney and the kids were walking through the shops and stuff, and I was there with Silas watching him. A guy just struck up a conversation with me. He said, you know, I've lived in the area for a year or so, and he moved from California, and I was a little bit familiar with some of the places he was mentioning, so we just we uh, started talking. And he was a Catholic guy, and he said, oh, you know, we got a, a priest that is bringing people back bringing people back to the church. And his big, big push is to bring people back to the church. And he said, you know, uh, you know I, I get a little more out of evangelical churches. That's what he told me. But he, said, but he said, it's good that the priest is trying to bring people back to the church. And I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, here's what's, what's great for you. I said, you have a chance to come back to your church. You know, whether it's Catholic or Protestant or whatever, if you got Jesus, of course, that's the main thing, if Jesus is in your heart. But I said, what's great for you is you have a chance to come back. But I said, there are so many people that they don't have a chance to come back because they've never had nothing. And he said, wow, that's, that's a good point. And his little grandkids, or maybe they were children, he was an older guy, I assume they were his grandkids, were running around that playground playing. And I said, what about, you know, what about your grandkids? Will they have anything to come back to if you don't get them into church? It's getting kind of hot out here, I better be going. <laughs> the conversation didn't last long after that. But think about that, you know, at least, at least if... if People have an experience with God. We don't want them to fall away, but they at least got something to come back to. But so many people have nothing to come back to because they haven't had that experience. Well, Jesus promises here that I will not leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. It's best to stay in a position of faith, a place where you just believe in God and believe in His Word and standing on His promise and, and living the life. But at times, we're going to get knocked off the tracks, aren't we? Those are not the times to give up and throw in the towel or commit suicide or do some kind of foolishness. Those are the times when you lean on the grace of God and you say, Lord, you promised me that you wouldn't leave me as an orphan. Will you come to me? And I can promise you with everything in me that God's Word is true and that Jesus will come to you. He will literally come to you and He'll strengthen you and He'll, he'll do whatever needs to be done. Well, he's a faithful father. He's also our adopted father. I mentioned this already, but let's just briefly read it again. It's Romans eight fourteen through 16. The Apostle Paul writes, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now again, last week I mentioned that's the word weos or the mature. That's the son that gets the possession. Not just the child. All right, We're all the children of God, but those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God that are walking in the blessing. They're walking in the promise. They're exercising their dominion over the earth because they're being led by the Spirit. Amen? So for as many as are led by the Spirit are the mature sons of God. For we did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. So the Word explains here to us in wonderful language that we're the adopted children of God, that we can, by being led by the Spirit, walk as the mature sons of God, exercising our dominion over all created things. And even a even better dominion than that, because it's a new and better covenant. But as we look at this, we see that we're adopted. And yet, in that adoption, it's not just the legal obligation, though God has that. Uh, but it's also an emotional investment. All right, The legal side of adoption, you have to, to uh, provide more for an adopted child than you do a natural born child. I'm told it's still that way. And the Roman Empire is very much that way. I don't know if even a child could be adopted. Definitely, most of the time, adoption in the Roman Empire officially happened as an adult. You know, maybe you raised the kid, you liked him, but usually he didn't get adopted until he was an adult. You adopted adult children. Because when you adopted that child, that child came into a full inheritance, a full possession 
uh, equal to or surpassing your natural born children. Once you adopted that child, you could never divorce that child. You could never separate yourself. You were legally obligated to that, that adopted son. Actually, you were adopting a son, not a child. But that adopted son, you were legally obligated to him uh, to give him the family name, the family resources, everything that, that comes with that. But God gave us so much more than the legal side of things, which we can exercise through the Holy Ghost. But God gave us an emotional investment. Because He wanted us. Really wrap your mind around that. Say this, say, God wanted me. He really, really wanted me. You know that's true? He adopted you. That's why there's, we believe in an age of accountability and a personal confession of faith. Because you have to personally believe. Because see, you know, God's not just... God don't have grandchildren, you know. He's not just taking you because you go to a church or whatever. But you have to believe upon the Lord Jesus and be saved. And as you do that, you're adopted in. But the work of the Holy Spirit started on you long before you made that confession of faith. God wanted you. And He put everything in your life into order to bring you into a place where you could make a real commitment to Him. A real decision for Him. And when He did that, He completely adopted you with the legal ramifications of that. And by the way, you can read it right here in many other places, that we're now called heirs and co-heirs with Christ Jesus our Lord, that as long as we're in Jesus, everything that Jesus has, we can have. That's good to have that logically, but we've got to get that down in our heart. But Jesus also made the emotional investment. He lets us call Him Daddy. The Proverbs say that if, if you uh, raise your servant if you spoil your servant, be careful because you'll end up having a son in the end. And, uh, you know, uh, there were probably a lot of cruel taskmasters, but there were probably some real good ones that, you know, took care of the, their servants' kids and took care of even the slave children and, and things like that. But even in the best situation, the slave child or the servant child was not allowed to say, Daddy. It was not allowed. The servant child could never say, Daddy. That's a fact especially among Roman slaves. Uh, the Roman slaves, no matter how much you loved that child that you were perhaps investing in, even though he was your servant's son, they could never call you daddy. You see, he no longer calls us servants. He calls us friends. And he calls us sons. We, he literally adopted us so that we could call him Daddy. So that there would be a legal, not just a legal obligation to provide for us, but a complete investment in our emotional well-being. He cares when you feel down in the dumps. He cares when you don't feel very good about yourself. And uh, the word of the Lord to some of you this morning is that you are uh, s significant. You are significant. You're important. You're valuable to God. What you have to offer, God wanted. God went out seeking the very skills that you bring into the kingdom. And then He implanted, of course, new gifts in us. But He went out seeking you. And He adopted you. Made a legal obligation to you. But beyond that, made an env emotional investment within you. And He said, I'm completely, 100% invested in you. Now I said all of that to say this. Our Father who art in heaven. You see, Jesus, how do you pray so effectively? How is it that you get these kind of results? I understand who my daddy is. And I understand my relationship with my daddy. Our Father who art in heaven. Then he goes on to say, how low would be thy name? Or how holy be thy name? Or how exalted and respected be your name? You see, the first move is on God's behalf. He adopts us as His children, takes a legal and an emotional obligation to care for us and to raise us. But the second step, only after God has made the first move, the second step is on our behalf. We have to choose to reverence and respect who God is and respect His name. Now, once you've been adopted, God will always love you as a child and He'll always display His grace to you, but there are places in God you're not going to reach until you learn to respect God, to reverence God. I mean really reverence God. 
I mean, there are a lot of times that things will happen that nobody else around knows what's happening, but you know in your heart what's happening. And you've got to make a decision in that moment to reverence God. I do this, uh, this uh, name and writing thing where I, where I can tell a lot about a person by, by the, their signature and by the writing and stuff like that. And the kids at school, they love that. They, it'll blow the whole class period. They'll want to spend the whole class period doing it. They'll literally line up and have a good time and giggle and laugh and find it funny. How'd you know that? Well, some of that's a prophetic edge that the Spirit, it's a point of contact that the Spirit uses and He reveals things. But I can't get into all that with them. But I've laid off that a lot because even though a lot of it is just looking at the, the way they write their name, that is a lot of it, part of it is a prophetic edge. And I've started to come to feel that if I can't put that within a context of giving God the glory for that prophetic edge, that I don't really want to do it because I'm not reverencing God. Does that make sense to you? So I've really laid off of it. I mean, I'll still do it some when I think I'm going to have a window opportunity to take it somewhere else. You know, I'll do that. No one else around me could know that. But in my heart, I know if I'm reverencing God or not. You want to pray and get the results like Jesus prayed? First of all, recognize who your Father is. Second of all, learn to reverence God. Holy be your name. I'll tell you what, I, I don't really, I don't think I cuss. And even when I get mad, I, I don't usually vocalize it with cussing. If on a very rare occasion it happens, there are some words that don't come out of my mouth, no matter how mad I am. Because I literally reverence God. And I'm just about as afraid of taking the Lord's name in vain that way as I am in not paying my tithe. I'm completely serious. I really appreciate what He's done for me. I mean, in the depths of my being, not just the salvation, though that, of course, means everything, but also the enduring commitment. You know, it would be like this, you know, Delany, I'm so in love with you. Oh, I love you so much. I'm going to kiss her. Okay, look, here's the kiss. you got to kiss me because you're in front of people or behind people. But All right? Oh, what a great wife I have. And then, you know, Kurt and I are hanging out. I don't know about that woman of mine, Kurt. I don't know what yours is like, but she was mine. I don't know what I would... I, what is that song, 101 Ways to Leave Your Lover? What is it? I don't know. Cause I, see, I'm, I'm being facetious here. But now, could you imagine if Delany was standing outside the door hearing all that? Would that affect our relationship? It would take a whole lot of making up to do, wouldn't it? So there ain't no way, by the grace of God given to me, that I'm going to, when I know Jesus is around me all the time, I'm going to devalue His name. I mean, if it's within my power, I'm going to give Him glory for something. And I'm going to reverence that name, and I'm certainly not going to take it as a profanity. Because I'm pretty sure that if you're, you know, everyone's got their issues. Don't be condemned. You can be forgiven. But if you're sitting there dropping Jesus' name like a curse word every time you get mad, and now you're up here, oh, heavenly, heavenly daddy, heavenly father, you know that money that I need? Oh, gee, I come to you in Jesus' name. That's right. Authority, Jesus' name. Hey, uh, remember yesterday? I was standing outside the door when you were talking, and you didn't reverence my name very well yesterday, did you? How come it feels so stuffy in here all of a sudden? <laughs> now look, we're not under condemnation; we're under grace. You admit it, you quit it, right? You got a problem, you got a sin, you just admit it, you quit it, you come before the Lord and thank God He's full of mercy. But you deal with it. Jesus, how can I get the same kind of results that you get? Well, first of all, you can understand your position with God, that God is your heavenly Father. Our Father who art in heaven. But second of all, you better start reverencing His name. You better start reverencing the work that He does within the earth. You better start giving God glory. Sometimes you just give God glory by saying thank you. You know, if someone says, Pastor, you preached real good, uh, you know, I don't, well, yeah, I spent three hours studying and, you know, six hours praying. And for you personally, sister, most of that time, and, well, that kind of loses something. You know, I'm just going to say thank you, probably. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm going to give God glory that way. 
But there are other times when you know you didn't do nothing. You just need to give God glory, right? It's an opportunity to give God glory, right? The reverence that we show for God's name is very likely one of the things that sets us apart from being the technon, child of God, from being the weos, mature children of God. Okay, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This clause of the Lord's Prayer really cuts a lot of our excuses out. If you think about it, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, who taught us how to pray this way? Was it Jesus? It wasn't just some some good preacher or, you know, uh, Muhammad or Buddha or something. It was Jesus that taught us, right? Right? And the reason that we want to know, Jesus, is because you got good results when you prayed, and we want to know how to get the same kind of results that you get, maybe even greater results. Well, first of all, son, you say, Our Father who is in heaven. You recognize His possession, position as Father. You hallow His name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, I'm a company man. I'm on the same team. All right? I'm trying to accomplish what God's trying to accomplish. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray effectively when we align our will with God's will. And we're trying to accomplish the same things. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever worked at a company where you got two people in leadership trying to accomplish different things, but it gets to be a mess quick. It, I've been at some of those places. You know, I, I haven't just, wasn't just born with a Bible in my hand, preaching. I've, I've worked, I've done, I've done uh, my time working out in the secular workplace too. And I've worked at those places where the right hand don't know what the left hand's doing and where you got two heads of the company wanting to go in completely different directions. That shouldn't be so in our life. We ought to be, headed, we ought to be a kingdom man headed in the same direction that the Holy Ghost is headed. Aligning ourselves with what Holy Ghost is doing. If we see the undeniable marks of the Holy Ghost on something that God's doing it, I want to get in it. All right? Because I'm a kingdom man. I'm, right, I'm aligning myself with God. Well, it cuts a lot of our excuses away as well because thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, Jesus just explained to us what God's will is. God's will is that earth be like heaven. That's what he says. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, just because God wills something at this time in history doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to happen. The Lord is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But will all come to repentance? Of course not, because we got a free will, right? All right. Well, there's coming a day when he's going to rule with an iron scepter, but we're not in that day at this moment. We're in a day where just because God wills it doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's going to happen when men, through the authority vested in us in the name, by the name of Jesus, uh, exercise that authority. That, that's when it happens, right? We're like His, we're His sons, but we're also His ambassadors in the world, right? We're exercising His authority. Well, it cuts our excuses away because we already know, first of all, if we're aligned with God's will, and if He's explained to us that my will for the earth is for earth to be as heaven is, then it cuts our excuses away. You mean it's not God's will for me to be sick sometimes? Well, but God used that sickness, brother. Sure, He used it, but God didn't cause you to get sick. God will use anything. All things work for the good of, of those who are, are the called of God according to His purpose who love God and are they called according to His purpose. Of course, everything's going to work in our good if we let it work in our good. But I'm sorry, last time I checked, how much sickness is in heaven? In heaven, we're on a, not on a calendar, we're in eternity, but just for the sake of understanding it, if we were on a seven-day calendar in heaven, how many days of that seven days could we be sick and still be considered to be in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now it doesn't mean that the full manifestation of this is realized in our lives, but it does mean that it is God's will for it to be in our lives. Do you understand that? It's God's will for it to be in our lives. 
Some of you got uh, sons and daughters that aren't serving the Lord, and with your whole heart, it's your will that they serve the Lord. Well, but no matter how much you will it, you can't make them serve the Lord, right? You can aid it and help it and lead them to it, but just because it's your will doesn't mean they're doing it, but it doesn't change the fact that it's your will. How many days out of that seven days would it be okay not to have uh, any money to do the will of God? Well, Lord... I know you want me to go preach in Madison, but I just don't have the gas money to get there. How many days out of seven would that be okay in heaven? How many days would it be okay just to keep a little grudge in heaven? Just a little bit of anger? Well, you see, it sounds foolish when we talk about it this way, but Jesus, how do we pray like you prayed and get the same results you get? First of all, you're going to recognize that God took the first step, that He's our Father in heaven. He's not everybody's Father. He's our Heavenly Father. His name is hallowed. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reverence His name. But the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to completely align myself with the will of God. And the will of God is often not what you've deceived yourself into thinking it is. It is not the will of God for you to be broke. It is not the will of God for you to be sick. It is not the will of God for you to be a little bit angry. It is, if it don't work in heaven, then it's not the will of God here. Are you hearing me? So, I know the full manifestation is at times hindered, but we got to be a kingdom man. we got to align ourselves with the will of God. You see, that's why people wanted to hear Jesus was He preached the kingdom. The good news, the gospel. What's the good news if you're poor? You don't have to stay poor. What's the good news if you're sick? You don't have to stay sick. But you see, you've got to believe it. The results that Jesus got starts by believing it. If you don't believe it's God's will, and if you don't believe it can fully manifest in this earth, then you're not going to get the results that Jesus got. Then he goes on to say, give us this day. Now, I'm really going to cut this a lot shorter than it deserves, all right? But we just got to give us this day our daily bread. This is not talking as much about bread as it's talking about daily abiding. We know that. The disciples made the same mistake. At one time, they were in the boat with Jesus, and Jesus said, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. And they said, Is it because we forgot to pack the bread? And Jesus said, Don't you remember? The 5,000 loaves. Or I'm sorry, don't you remember the, the loaves and the fishes that fed the 5,000? And then again they fed the 7,000. Do you really think I'm concerned about bread? He said, be, be aware of the religiosity. The religious systems and ways of thinking of the Pharisees. That's what he war was warning them about. The very same warning echoes through here. Give us this day our daily bread. What Jesus is saying is that daily provision comes by daily abiding. Uh, we don't got time to go there, really, but you can look it up on your own. John 15, 7 and 8, abide in me and I'll abide in you. Psalm 91, 1. Listen, I do want to read this one. Listen to, what, listen to the words. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He who dwells where? In the secret place of the Most High, he who what, where, dwells. You see, it's about abiding. The secret to provision is abiding. And the secret really to everything is abiding in the vine. You produce fruit because you abide in the vine, right? So this isn't just about bread. You know, uh, uh, Jesus, will it be white or whole wheat today? That's not what it's talking about. But if you abide, now look, this will answer a lot of stuff for you. Now I'm not, I'm not casting judgment or blame or anything like that because we love people. Everyone say, Pastor loves people. Because I mean it, alright? But if you haven't spent any time abiding, then when the tornado's heading for your house, I would find the deepest, darkest place you can to hide because you got no guarantee that prayer is going to work then. You haven't been abiding. But if you've been abiding in the secret place of the Most High, and if you've been exercising these things that Jesus is teaching us, you can say to the wind and the wave in the same authority that Jesus said it and exercise authority over it. 
But the key is abiding. You can't be in and out of God and expect to get the results that Jesus got. Okay, we'll use Delany again. And this is completely conjecture. I can't be your, my only main squeeze today, Delany. And tomorrow, well, let me just have this other girl for one day. I'll come back to you tomorrow. Delany, you're my only main squeeze today. And tomorrow, well, I don't like the way Delany treated me yesterday. So you're my main squeeze. Now, how long would that relationship work? It wouldn't work at all, would it? You can't be in and out of God and expect to get the same results. That's what Jesus chastised the apostles for. If the one thing that got Jesus mad was unbelief in His people. He didn't get mad at, oh, they messed up, they sinned, they whatever. He got mad at unbelief. And He said, how do you not get it yet? You see, it wasn't that they didn't have faith. Peter walked on the water. But it was that Peter could walk on the water one minute and he could be, you know, denying Jesus the next during, until the Spirit came. And he became the Huyos, Son of God, by walking in the Spirit. That's what will happen. The key to abounding is abiding. you got to abide in God. Jesus is saying this is how prayer will work. Uh, give me five more minutes. Sons in the Lord... Jesus next says, you must forgive. You want your prayer to be effective like mine? You must forgive. Look what it says here, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now we've glazed over that with so many coats of religion throughout the years that we've nearly lost what it means. Have you ever painted a fence or a deck that's been painted like 30 times before? And you got an inch of flaking off paint under there that you're painting. That's what we've done to this passage. But let me tell you perhaps a better way to read it. You ready for this? In the same way I forgive others, forgive me, Jesus. Woo! In the same way I forgive others, forgive me, Jesus. Well, Harriet, I'll forgive you except for that one thing. Okay, Lord, I know I messed up bad. I know I messed up bad, God, but please forgive me. Lord, in the same way I forgave Harriet, forgive me. Okay, Dave, I'll forgive you everything but that one thing. How many things does it take not to get into heaven? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many sins are allowed in heaven? Whoo, praise God for grace, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. For give me my debts, even as I've forgiven the debts of other people. In the same way that I've forgiven other people, forgive me. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus got results. Now look at this. They caught this woman in adultery. And they thought they were so pious and they threw her at Jesus' feet. What should we do with her? We caught her in the very act of adultery. Jesus writes on the ground and He says, well, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. How many of you know there was only one person that could throw a stone in that situation? And He didn't. There was only one person that could throw a stone and He didn't. So now, this is how Jesus gets results. Heavenly Father, Forgive them in the same way that I've forgiven them. Does that bring a little different insight into that? You see, when we're praying the way that Jesus taught us to pray to get results, we're praying like this. Father, forgive me even in the same way that I've forgiven others. That's what it says. Now, we'll, we'll just glaze over the last real quickly, but do, do notice this, that Jesus comes back to this. Let's at least read those verses at the end. Verse 14 and 15, He says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This meant so much to Jesus that He, took, he spent right here three times more explaining it than He actually spent saying it. He says, pray this way, Father, forgive me in the same way I've forgiven others. And then he comes back and he spends three times longer right here in this context explaining it. That's how important it was to effective prayer. You know, uh, probably of everything, this is the most important 
thing we're even hitting on this morning. Because uh, if you haven't forgiven other people, then you're not going to be forgiven yourself. And that, that hinders the atonement in your physical healing, in your spiritual, your mental, every aspect of your life. The blood of Jesus paid for it. So if you're saying, Jesus, uh, heal my finger. Jesus is saying, I'll heal your finger in the same way that you've forgiven your brother. Have you completely forgiven your brother? Okay, then I'll completely heal your finger. You see, it was one atonement. Listen to this story. Her name was Prisoner 66730. But you would know her as Corey Ten Boom. It was at a church service in Munich that I saw him. The former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly it was all there. The room full of mocking men. The heaps of clothing. Betsy's pain-blanched face. He came up to me as the church service was emptying, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fruin. To thank, as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. And I, who had preached so often to the people in Blue Mandal, the need to forgive kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled within me and through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand, but I could not. I felt nothing. Not the slightest spark of warmth nor charity. And so again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I reached out and took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. My shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our own forgiveness any more than it is on our own goodness. This world's healing hinges, but it's on His. When He tells us to love our enemies, He gives along with the command, the love itself. She gets, thank God, the revelation that we all need to get again and again, that it's not our forgiveness, it's His forgiveness that we're giving. And that He'll give us the power to forgive. Delaney made one of the most profound statements I've ever heard on forgiveness. It's been a couple years back now. She said, we call them grudges, but the Bible calls it unforgiveness. Do you want to get the results that Jesus got when He prayed? Get rid of them. Absolutely, completely, wherever they're at. Because remember, in effect, we're saying... Lord, forgive me, heal me, save me, whatever I'm asking, in the same way that I've forgiven others. So if I've forgiven in part, guess what? I'm going to get what I'm asking for in part. But if I'll surrender myself and draw upon His strength, His forgiveness will flow. I'll get all that I need. The last clause, I believe, is a clause of uh, security. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For those that will pray like Jesus taught us to pray, those that will persist in believing God and just living it out through His strength, we will see the actualization in our lives of His kingdom, of His will being done. Hallelujah. Isn't it great when you actually receive the healing? When you actually get to walk in divine health instead of having to ask for healing? You actually get to walk in divine prosperity instead of having to ask? for a miracle in your finances, we will actualize the kingdom in our lives when we learn to pray like Jesus prayed.